Hello, I'm Pastor Ed Knatzer with Refuge Christian Fellowship Church, and we are moving forward in our series on ancient paths, and um, we're going to be looking into the second path of seven uh, today, and so before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to ask for your Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts to this path. Um, that you have laid before us in our lives. Help us to understand it. Help us to embrace it. Help us to move forward on it. And we give ourselves to you fresh and anew. Holy Lord, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. And I ask you that I would not say anything of my own self. I pray I would decrease and that you would increase. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been looking uh, at the topic of ancient paths. We saw that uh, in the scriptures, it says that when you and I come at a crossroads in life, that you and I are to stand at these points of decision in life. And we are to ask for the ancient paths. We're to cry out for the good way, ask where the good way is. And then it says we're to walk in it. Um, now, God gives us his instruction because his desire is to bless you to bless me in our walk with him. So uh, we looked last, the last couple of weeks, we're looking at the ancient path of prophecy, being that we walk in the prophetic. We, we walk in the light of what God has said will be. And we've covered that in the past couple of weeks. But today we're going to go in and look at the next path. And this particular path is the path of adversity. Now, as we said, coming to know Jesus as your Savior opens the door, and God and Jesus, because of uh, our faith in Christ, the gift of salvation positions you and I to get to know God. Now, and so Jesus begins to reveal the Heavenly Father to us. Jesus prayed this in John 17, I came that they might know thee, the only true God in Christ who now has sent. So Jesus begins to reveal the Father through these seven paths. The path we're looking at today is the path of adversity or struggles or trials. Now, as we go into this, I want you to know that, that um, you know, there are a lot of people who believe um, that Christianity could be summed up in God delivering us from adversity. Um, but the truth is we're delivered in adversity. Um, in other words, the Christian life is 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 not um, clear of any adversity. Uh, the reality of it is we do have adversity. And, and God wants you and I to understand this path that we're on. Um, not only do we walk in the prophetic, living in light of what God has said, but we need to do that when we're on the path of adversity, when you and I are going through trials and tribulations. So as we look at this today, we want to remember that that this path of adversity, we are being delivered in the midst of adversity. And this becomes a strength to you and I when we begin to understand that God is our deliverer, even in the midst of the adversity. No matter what you're going through right now, no matter what the adversity is that is hitting you in life, um, it may look totally absurd that you could have victory in it. But but with God, you can have victory. See, when your focus is on the Lord, then his victory is there for you, even in the midst of adversity. So let's go on and look at this. And, um, you know, when you, when you consider this, um, the, 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 one of the, what's believed to be one of the most ancient or the oldest books in the Bible um, is the book of Job. And it records a fascinating um, record. It has a record of a man who is traveling on the path of adversity. When you look at the book of Job, it tells the story and you can see him going through this journey of adversity. He loses everything. He loses everything and it's tragic um, what happens to him. And as he goes through, we, this reveals two things to you and I. I'm condensing this. Uh, one of the, one, two of the things that we can see there uh, and I'm convinced this so we can grasp this, um, is that, <coughs> excuse me, 
is that we're, we will be tempted in two ways. On the, on, the, on the path of adversity, we will be tempted two ways. And the book of Job shows us, number one, we'll be tempted to curse God. We'll be tempted to curse God, get angry at God, or blame God. His wife, Job's wife, tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, this temptation comes because the suffering, the adversity, was so great. And then the, the second thing is that there's the temptation to question God, to question God's goodness, his wisdom. And so we see these two things here. Um, but Job's own words, you know, he tells his wife, he says, you know, uh, you, you speak as a foolish woman. He said, he said, should we receive blessing from the hand of God and not adversity? you know, uh, or good, not evil. Listen, the idea here is that Job trusted God even when he was going through adversity. And so here you have one of the oldest books in the Bible. The whole story is recorded, his, his, his journey on the path of adversity. Now, one of the interesting things, and we don't want to miss this, is that book also shows that if, if you're traveling on the adver path of adversity with God, it's going to, it will end in blessing. It will end in blessing. And so, so as we go in to look at this topic today, um, we're going to look at David's journey on the ancient path of adversity. You see this throughout the Psalms. We saw it in Psalm 119 uh, over the past couple months going through that study. But just to point out a few here, in Psalm 23, 4, a familiar passage, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now, another, what he's saying there is even though I'm going, I'm going through a valley and, and there's a shadow, death is right there. It's like you're going to die. Um, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's, there's this, this path of adversity. You know, you know, there, there are paths sometimes on this path. You will go through places in life where you, it, everything around you tells you you're going to, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. Maybe it's a sickness, maybe it's a, a situation you're in, but but there are things that, that we find ourselves on a, uh, the path of adversity where it feels this way. Everything in the natural realm speaks that we're not going to make it. But he says here, I will, what? I will fear, what? No evil. Even though I'm walking through this, I'm not going to fear evil. Um, for you are, what? With me. You're with me. And your staff, they comfort me. So there's this picture that even though you're going through this this uh, this place of the the valley of the shadow of death, and he says, "But I will not fear, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me." The presence of God becomes the very thing that gives them strength in adversity. Notice it doesn't say it doesn't say, "Hey, if you if you love me and and you follow me." You're not going to have to go through any valleys where there's a shadow of death, or you're not going to have to go through any adversities or trials. The scripture doesn't teach that. It teaches that this path of adversity is necessary, and it's a part of every Christian's journey. The Bible says, so we should not think it's strange. We, we, we should be, not be shocked, overwhelmed, surprised, dismayed, and think it as though some strange thing is happening to us when a trial comes. Or an adversity comes. I love Philip's translation of in James chapter one. It says, "It says when a trial comes, listen, we're to we're in, to embrace it as a friend. We're, we're to embrace it as someone as a familiar thing, and we understand that it's for the good. Uh, that's really powerful. And um, so we we go through and we press on to look at this further." In James 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So again, we see this laid down from the book of Job going through just David's writings. That, uh, the path of adversity is necessary for the growth and the purifying of our walk and our faith in Jesus Christ. You're not born, we're not born with a perfect faith and we're we're not born again with a perfect faith and we're not born again 
uh, and with, as being a Christian who has come to perfection. No, we, we grow. God works in our lives to get rid of the old and brings in the new. And, and this is a daily journey with the Lord. And every day of our lives, in some way, it does involve adversity. So Jesus' teaching on the ancient paths is important to see too. So not only record, is it recorded in Job, not only do you see it all throughout the Psalms and David's writings, but we also see it in Jesus' teaching on the ancient paths. So Mark 8.34 says, and call, Jesus it says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is a familiar passage of scripture to a lot of Christians, and yet it talks about adversity. The, one of the, the things that you have here that point to adversity is it says that we need to deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow Christ. Um, you can't follow Christ on your terms. The Christ, Christians today, we, we think we can follow Jesus on our terms. We think we can we can follow Jesus on a percentage rate. Maybe I'll follow Jesus 20% or maybe 50%, you know, I'll follow Jesus. But when you read these words, these are not the words of, of 50%. These are not the words of 75%. These are, these are the words of 100% surrender to Christ to follow him. Jesus said again, if you, if anyone would would come after me. If they want to follow me, Jesus said, let him what? Deny himself. That's adversity. That is adversity when you deny yourself. Listen, then take up his cross and follow me. Not only do you deny yourself, not only do, see, because every time you tell yourself no, you are crucifying your flesh. That's not a one-time experience. You don't try that out one time and then say, okay, I did that. No, it's a way of life. Listen, it is a way of life. Say, say that with me. It's a way of life. Listen, to deny myself is a what? A way of life. To take up my cross is what? It's a way of life. It's not something we tried a couple years ago or we tried, you know, whenever, but it's it become, it's a choice. It's a way of life, and it's choosing adversity. Listen, the path of adversity, you there's a place where you choose this path to walk on it. And so we see this, he says, and for him to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus taught these words. We see it in Mark 13, 13. He says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. The day is coming when the whole world will hate you and hate me for our faith in Christ and in our, our life that we desire to live for the glory of God. What, what's it say? But the one who endures till the end will be saved. Well, you know, that, that word endures, it means that you're going you're gonna to have to go through a period, you and I will go through a period where there is going to be a hatred um, a hatred against us because of our love and faith in Jesus Christ. And there needs to be an endurance in our lives. Je Jesus speaking those words here to us. That in the midst of adversity, we are going to need endurance. And, um, you know, like we said, we're not delivered. We're not just delivered. The idea of being delivered from a, a, um, of all adversity in life and just living a life without any problems is not taught in scripture. But what is taught in scripture is you and I going through adversity and God delivering us in the midst of adversity. And so this is something we need to come and understand. Uh, this is probably the most rejected ancient path of the seven we're going to look at. This is the one that the church, that the, the children of God have the biggest problem with. In a lot of ways, we're no different than Israel. When trials come in our life and, and adversity comes along, we, it's very easy. We can start whining and complaining. We, we, we can start um, looking at God with suspicion. 
We start judging his character. Well, all of those things are signs of immaturity on our part spiritually. There are signs of immaturity on our part spiritually. You can, you can give yourself over physically to God 100% to do something, and it's, it's going to result in you being exhausted, me being exhausted. But it's when we give ourselves over to God spiritually, this is when we find the strength. See, we want the strength so that we can live a victorious life. God says, no, live a victorious life and you'll find the strength. There, there, there's, he brings the strength after the fact. You say, wait a minute, doesn't God give me the strength to live a godly life? He does. But, he, but first he gives you the strength to choose right or wrong. That strength is there. Every, the believer, you, as a child of God, he gives you the strength to make a choice. And he, we have the strength to choose Christ. And when you and I choose Christ in the midst of adversity, then we find that his strength and life pours in on the end of that. And we, we come out of that whole journey stronger than when we went in. But a lot of times we say, no, wait a minute, God, that doesn't make any sense. I want you to give me the strength now. And, and so I can trust you um, and, and you're going to take care of the problem tomorrow. So I don't have to worry about it. I want you to take care of my problems, take care of the tomorrow and whatever is coming up. And so I don't have to worry about it. I trust you for that. God says, no, trust me for today. I'm going to give you the strength today to choose to trust me. You have the strength today to choose to trust me, God says. Don't worry about tomorrow. I'm going to take care of that. But you trust me today. But see, we don't, we don't want that. We want God to go ahead of us and take care of all the problems so that when we look in or down the road, we don't have anything to worry about. Well, no, the Christian life is not like that. The truth of the matter is we got, in, through the eyes of the flesh, in our natural realm, we would have plenty to worry about looking into the next week, next month, or next year. But we choose, by the strength of God, we choose to what? To trust Him. And when you trust God and rest in Him, even though what you know tomorrow's coming or what you think is coming a week from now, even though it looks horrible, you're trusting God today. And, and this is where we find that His supernatural um, um, impartation comes to bring and change things that are happening in us, around us. But it's when we trust him for today. This is why, this is why it's so important that we walk, we understand this ancient path of adversity. Because it's where we learn to trust God today. Even though we want to worry about tomorrow, God said, don't do that. Trust me today. Trust me today. See, God is an ever-present God. His strength is there for you today. He's not going to give you an eye of strength for tomorrow when we're not even there yet. He's going to give you the strength today to trust him for tomorrow. Amen. So when we when we look at this, we need to understand he's saying you're going to be hated on the count of me for my name's sake by all. Listen, hated by all and what? But the one who endures till the end will be saved. So again, this word endurance is key to being on this ancient path of adversity. God is grooming and birthing, strengthening us in endurance. You and I aren't going to get strong by laying around and doing nothing. You're not going to get strong spiritually by laying around and, and watching your favorite Christian TV show or listening to your Christian music. That's not going to strengthen you. That'll make you feel good but it's not going to strengthen you. What's going to strengthen you? It's when, it's when you have adversity in your life and at the crossroads of that dealing with that adversity, you choose adversity. You choose to trust your God for tomorrow. You choose to rest in him. What's the scripture say? He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of the almighty. And what's it going to say? You know, there's promises given in Psalm 91. I hear people claiming them and teaching on them. Listen, the, the Psalm 91, you know, no plague will come near you, you know, and no evil will befall you. Well, remember, who is that to? 
Who are those promises given to? And they said, well, the children of God. No, read what it says. It says, he who dwells in the secret place. Not all God's children are dwelling there. Listen, the, word, the idea of dwelling with God, it means that you are intimate with his presence. God, what's God doing? He's calling you to be intimate with his presence. Why does he give us Psalm 91? He gives it to us so we will be drawn into the secret place with him. So, so there's benefits of it. We read the benefits and, and we understand that that comes from being in the secret place with the Lord. But listen, casual Christianity, the Christianity of America today, is not dwelling in the presence of God. We need to be, we need to be focused and indwelling in the personal, intimate presence of God in our time with Him in the Word, in our prayer lives. Those are the ones who have the blessing of Psalm 91. Those are the ones. But for those Christians... The people in church who just wear Christianity as a badge, they pull it out when it's convenient and put it on. Those promises aren't for them. You got to be in his presence. You got to dwell in the presence of the secret place with the Lord. And you say, well, I don't know what that means. Well, make it a good, that's a good goal to know what that means before the year 2020 is out. To spend time in prayer with the Lord in his word and get to know what it means to be in the secret place with God. This is like a, um, a husband and wife have their bedchamber. It's the secret, intimate place with the Lord. It's where, it, and, and it's where you go in and you, you just bear your all before God and be real with him in the, in the intimacy of his presence with you. And you do that through prayer and being in his word. And you will find that when you're in there and you're in that presence, in his presence, that ad path of adversity, oh yeah, you may be traveling on it, but guess what? It's not touching you. It's not affecting you. It's not depressing you. It's not freaking you out. It's not overwhelming you and scaring you to death. Why? Because you are dwelling in the secret place of the Lord and in the shadow of the Almighty. And from that place, you can just say of the Lord, he is my refuge. And you can go down and read Psalm 91 and see the blessings and promises that are made to you. The one who's dwelling in the presence of God. It's so important. So we see here, it's the one who endures till the end will be saved. God is birthing and that endurance in you and I through this adversity. This endurance will not come any other way. You, will, you and I won't learn endurance by being blessed. We, we will not. We, we are too, our hearts are too wicked and selfish. And we're just, we just need, we need God's teaching in our lives and his classroom, his atmosphere. We need the, the classroom atmosphere of God. And sometimes that's adversity. Don't fight against adversity in your life. As J.B. Phillips' translation, as I say again, when it comes, embrace it as a friend and you hold on to it so it has its perfect, complete work of endurance in your life. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have what? Peace. Now listen to the words. In me, that's the, that's the intimate place, the personal place, you may have peace. In the world, you will have what? Tribulation. But take heart or be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, again, here you have this dwelling, this, this idea of in Christ, we have peace. We're not going to have it anywhere else. You're not going to have it if you're not dwelling in Christ. That means you're in his word. That means you're in communication with him and you are living your life daily dependent on him and trusting in him. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about God's help on this ancient path of adversity. And we look at that in Isaiah 43, 1. The prophet writes, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, listen to, listen to this. 
Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. Now, I want to say this right up front. These are three key points that you and I need to remember on this when we're traveling the path, this ancient path of adversity. When we're going through trials, we need to remember these three things. We're not to fear. These, and this is why. There's three reasons. Number one, he has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are redeemed. I, in other words, God purchased my soul and your soul. Listen, with the blood of his son, Jesus, it was paid for. We have been redeemed. Number two, he says, I have summoned you by name. This is so important. Did you know that God has summoned you? He has called you. He's called you to him by name. By name. This is so important that you and I can hear this in our heart and, and hear the word of the Lord say and speak in our name as he says, come follow me. It's that personal, it's that intimate that you are summoned by name. See, a lot of times we read the, the things in scripture, like just what we read with Jesus taught, whosoever, whosoever would want to follow me or anyone who wants to follow me. It's a general thing. But Isaiah speaks the word here. He summons us by name. He says, fear not, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. And the third important thing for us to remember on the road of adversary, adversity, he says, and you are mine. In other words, we belong now to the Lord Jesus Christ. He purchased us, he summoned us, and we're his. Amen. He purchased us, he summoned us, and we are his. These three things are important. Why? Because look what, look what the scripture goes on and says here. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, God says. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Why? Why does God make you the promise here? As we're going through this, he's making you a promise. He's saying, I've redeemed you. I've summoned you, redeemed you, summoned you, and what? And he, he is bringing us through these, these trials, through these two ideas. You pass through the waters, they will. Uh, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Why does he do it? Because his presence is with you because what? You belong to him. You belong to him. He's going to watch over you because you belong to him. And this is so important that we know this on the path of adversity. What's it do? It keeps us from giving in to fear. What did, what did it say? It just told us, fear not. Amen? Fear not. So as we go on, listen to the promises that he goes on to make. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. So He's got two extremes here. He's saying you go through the water, you know, not going to overcome you. The rivers aren't going to overrun you. He says, I'm going to be with you. When you go through the fire, listen, you're not going to be burned. The flames are not going to set you ablaze. Verse three, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel. What? Your Savior. What does it mean to have God as our Savior? It means that he has redeemed us. He summoned us and we are his. And listen, he says, because of that, I will be with you through the water, through the rivers, through the fire. I'm going to be with you. He gives you three reasons to not be afraid. He gives you three promises of what he's going to do for you and I on the path of adversity. Listen, when we go through the waters, he'll be with us. And the rivers will not overflow us. And when we go through the fire, they're not going to set us ablaze. Listen, why? For I am the Lord, what? Your God. He's my God. He's your God. It becomes the foundation. It becomes the strength. It becomes that, that uh, it becomes the very source of our ability to walk on the path of adversity and not be filled with fear. Not be filled with fear. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how impossible something looks to you right now if you're going through adversity. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how overwhelming it is or how absurdly ridiculous it is to think 
that God could do a miracle for you on this path of adversity. God is calling you. He's saying, listen, I've redeemed you and I've summoned you by name and you are mine. What has he summoned us to do? To trust him. He's called us. He's literally speaking your name today and calling you to trust him. If you trust you in the word, he says, anyone who trusted me, anyone who trusted my word will never be ashamed if they did. Never be ashamed. This is, we're, this is real Christianity that we're talking about here. This is, as we move on, this is, leads us to what our response to adversity should be. So on this ancient path, how should we respond? So we've seen, we've seen the record in Job, we've seen with David, we've seen Jesus' teachings on it. We've seen that God is our help, promised us help. So what should be our response? Well, I think you could look at those things and be pretty clear. But let's, let's touch on two different passages of Scripture before we close. Familiar passage here. This is what I was talking about. One in James, when I quoted J.B. Phillips' translation. But this, here it is. Um, it says, count it all joy. This is not J.B. Phillips. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, the words count it all joy. You, you get that idea. It's like opening the door and seeing a friend. You embrace your trial as a friend. You say, that sounds like total insanity. What is insanity in the flesh is being sober in the spirit. It looks like it's total insanity in the flesh, but you are never more sober in the spirit when you do this. When a trial comes, you count it all joy. Why? Why? For you know, here it is. We count all joy for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. So here it is. When the trial comes my way, I say, oh, you know what? Praise God. God is, God is working in me. This is a test of my faith. The testing of my faith what, what, what's God testing me for? Well, the truth of that is just, do I trust him? Do you and I trust him? We've been, maybe you've been saved 10 years, 15, 20 years. Maybe you've only been saved one year. Do you trust him? How long have you known God in your life? How, how long have you been a Christian? And do you trust him more today than you did last month? Or that you did last year? Are you trusting him more? Because he's still the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still the God of the Bible. This is why he calls himself, when you go back and look at the previous scriptures, just jump back here as a reminder. Listen, listen to what he's saying here. He's telling you who he is. At the end, verse 3, For I am the Lord, your God, what? The Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In other words, you're not putting your trust in a God that you made up. It's not an empty hope. Christianity is not built on foolishness. It's built on a historical, supernatural record of the God who created heaven and earth, who chose Israel and dealt with it through the record of him dealing with Israel. And then he says, I'm your God, and I am going to be with you. I am the Lord your God. And now, guess what? I am your Savior. See, so... What, what does it mean that the testing of our faith? What's that talking about? Our faith in him. When we're on the, we're on the path of adversity, the testing of our faith produces what? Endurance. You know, um, some, some, some adversities come along, they're more scarier than others. The, the, the situation, circumstances seem bigger than other things we've been through. And those, those stretch us. Listen, those, those challenge our faith. And some, and we always, I've heard people say, you know, the things are just getting worse. Trials are getting harder. Well, what's God doing? He's growing our faith. Why? Because he's in stretching and increasing our endurance. Why? Because the one who endures to the end will be what? Saved. Amen. This endurance that God is developing in your life and my life is more valuable than we realize. Because it's what brings us through. To be a victorious in Christ. 
So how do we respond? As we've been seeing in James, the testing of our faith produces steadfastness or endurance. It says, and let steadfastness have its full effect or its perfect work that you may be what? Perfect and complete. <clears throat> A lot of times we think in our minds that, you know what? I'm never going to be perfect. You know, but, but what God doing? He's, he's, it doesn't matter what we feel like we'll never be. Or God is drawing us to perfection. And he's going to bring that about in our lives. Now, we can grow in that. The more we surrender to God in our walk here on earth, we're transformed into the image of Christ. <clears throat> and whatever measure we need to grow in, when he appears, the Bible says, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And he says, you know, he's returning for the one who longs for his appearing. And that why, why do we long? Because we want to be made complete and perfect. Why do we yield to God on the path of adversity? Why do we surrender and trust him when it seems totally ridiculous? Because what? Because he's drawing us into the image of Christ. He's, he's increasing our endurance. He's testing our faith. And we know we, we know this. We need to know this so that we don't give way to fear on the path of adversity. So important. We do not give way to fear. We're going to finish it up by looking at Romans 1 through 5. 5 chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by what? Faith. Remember, your faith will be tested on the ancient path of adversity, and we're justified by it. In other words, when God's, when that faith that you and I have in God and what Jesus did on the cross for us to forgive us of our sins, this is what justifies us. This is what saves our soul. It's not, it's not no good deed that we can do can get us to heaven. It's our faith in Christ. The just shall live by faith, the scripture says. And faith moves forward, the scripture says. For by grace, you have been saved through what? Faith. It's a gift of God, not of ourselves, so that no one can boast. Faith is so important. We're so, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, the word justified means justified, never sinned, by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, what Jesus did on the cross for me and my faith in him gives me peace with God. Because he paid for my sin. He paid for your sin. And you put your faith in what he did for you. So it says here, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. <clears throat> in other words, through Christ, through Christ, we have an access by our faith. We have access into this grace which we stand. The grace is when you and I get what we don't deserve. So Jesus has, Jesus has made access possible for you and I when we believe in him and puts us in a place where his grace gives us what we don't deserve. And listen, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In other words, we're excited because we know the day's coming when we're going to be with Jesus, when we're going to, the hope that we have in God, the glory of God coming. And the Bible says the glory of God will one day cover the earth. This is our hope, and we rejoice in that. More than that, here we go, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Read that with me. More than that, more than Ah, this is so powerful. More than rejoicing in what we're longing for in heaven, more than rejoicing in the glory of God coming one day, and we're gonna we're gonna be a part of that whole thing. He says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, tell me what kind of understanding we must have to rejoice more even more in the glory than the glory of the Lord, we're going to rejoice even more in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance. How is that even possible? 
Here, here it is. Without endurance, which is produced by faith, we would not see the glory of God. Do you understand that your faith in Christ is going to produce an endurance? Why? Because on the path of adversity, you and I are going to trust him and rely upon him. And in that we grow. In that we move forward and we grow in endurance. It says here, listen, we rejoice in our sufferings. Know that knowing that sufferings produce endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. In other words, God is, God's love being poured out upon you and I is the seal. It's the evidence of his Holy Spirit. We're sealed in that. And in that, listen, it says that this is the promise that we have from the Lord. That this is where he's bringing us through. That this suffering, it produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because we're hoping in, in God's love for us. And we love him because he first loved us. This is so important to understand that on, on this ancient path of adversity is the key to endurance. And endurance unlocks the door to all these dimensions of growth in your life and mine in our character and our hope. It's just so powerful. I, I pray that no matter where you're at on this path of adversity, it doesn't matter what that adversity is. I pray today that you find the place where you can trust God, trust the one who died for you, trust the one. It says if he did not if he, gave, if he didn't withhold his own son from you, if he gave his son for you, would he not freely give you all things pertaining to life and godliness? He's going he's to provide for you. He, he is going to be your deliverer, not from adversity, but in the midst of it. Why? Because he's producing endurance in you and I. Because we are going to be of the remnant who endure till the end. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you today, God, to strengthen us on the path of adversity. Help us to trust you. Help us to be the ones who deny ourselves and take up our cross. Help us to be the ones who remember that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Lord, help us to remember your promise for help on this path of adversity. God, help us, Lord, to remember that we have been redeemed, that you've summoned us by name, and that we belong to you. God, we give ourselves afresh and anew to you tonight. Forgive us for giving way to fear. And Lord, we cast away fear now in the name of Jesus Christ, no matter what it is that we're coming against, no matter what the adversity, we're trusting you today to take care of this. Lord, today we trust you for tomorrow. Today we choose to trust you for next week. You have given us the strength today that we need to choose you over worry, over fear. We choose to trust you. This is our decision. This is our faith. We act on it because we know what the word of God says. And we know who you are in the Bible. And we know that we can trust you. So God, we take all of our problems, all of the storms, all the adversities, trials and tribulations and sufferings. And we cast them at your feet. And we trust you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We pray this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray you have a great week. And uh, don't shy away from this path in your life. Be bold. Um, trust the Lord in it. And uh, you're going to find that he's going to bring you through to victory. God bless.